Welcome to the 178th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with best-selling historical novelist Bernard Cornwell. Stay tuned for the interview. And just a quick message before we start the show, Jim Kukral from the Author Marketing Institute contacted me and asked if I could tell you about a virtual event they're doing for authors starting on January 26th. And the reason I'm mentioning mentioning this is because I know that a lot of my listeners are uh, writers and authors or aspiring writers. Um, this event is called the Author Marketing Live, and it's an online event for authors. That means you don't have to travel to attend the event. You just log in, and you can watch over 15 presentations from some best-selling authors and authorpreneurs. Some of the presenters will include Steve Scott, an author who earns over $60,000 a month with Kindle books, as well as fiction and nonfiction experts like Joel Kamm, Lewis Howes, and Peter Shankman. Also, Mark Coker, the CEO of Smashwords, is presenting as well. So you can check out the agenda and you can get your seat for only $99 to attend the uh, virtual event online. Again, you don't have to travel. This is an online event. Um, and I'm letting you know about this, as I said, because I know that a lot of the listeners are authors. So all you have to do is use the coupon code Jeff during checkout, and you can visit authormarketinglive.com. Again, again, that's authormarketinglive.com, and the coupon code is Jeff. And stay tuned for the interview. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is best-selling historical novelist Bernard Cornwell. Cornwell has written the long-running Richard Sharp series, chronicling Sharp's adventures as a British soldier during the Napoleonic Wars. Cornwell also writes other historical novels, including the Warrior Chronicles and Saxon Tales, about early British history. The Empty Throne, Cornwell's latest novel, which has just been published, is the eighth novel in the Saxon Tale series. Bernard, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Well, if Good someone great. Well, if someone listening hasn't heard about the Empty Throne yet, how would you describe your new novel? Well, you've already told me it's the eight in the series, and it's, it's uh, I mean, all, almost all historical novels have a big story and a little story, and the trick is to put the little story in the foreground and the big story in the background. And the, the big story of these novels about a man called Uhtred is the making of England. I mean, I mean the great thing about, I, you know, I live in America, and I'm an American citizen now, and I know when the birthday is, it's July the 4th, 1776. You know, you can date America's birth. But nobody knows where England came from. At least nobody I know knows. I mean, if you go back to England and ask the English, where did England start? They haven't got a clue. So what these books are about is, is the process that actually made England. That's the big story. And that's in the, in, in the background. And in the foreground is the story of a man called Uhtred, who is obviously totally bound up in this process that ended up with the creation of a country. So I think that's, that's what I tell them. Great. Well, well, with the Saxon tales, as you just mentioned, you're writing about a time period that that um, isn't as well documented as more modern history. Do do you find that a handicap when you're researching and planning these novels? No, it's wonderful. It leaves lots of gaps that I can <laughs> fill. I mean, it's it's you know, I keep having to tell people I write fiction. They 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 write in and say that you know this didn't happen. And I say, well, because it didn't happen. It's a story. It's fiction. I mean, the big story has to be true. You can't have you can't have Napoleon winning the Battle of Waterloo because that's you know people will just think it's ridiculous. Uh, but but the little story you make up as you go along, and, and and it is made up. And the nice thing about writing about the Saxon period, in fact, we know quite a lot about Alfred the Great, uh, the king who starts the process of the making of England, because he was very literate and he he wrote a lot of things himself. And a uh, a bishop called Asser wrote a life of Alfred while Alfred was alive. But once Alfred dies in the year eight nine nine. It's like a light goes out, and suddenly we're in the dark, and we really can't quite see what's going on. But that's great for me, because I can just make it up. Um, if you're writing a novel, I read a novel not long ago called The Fort, which is set in the American Revolution, and you really can't make anything up in that, because it's a it's sacred high ground of American legend. Uh, and, and, you know, it's a far more research, getting everything right in a book like The Fort. And I'm writing another Saxon tale right now, and, and we sort of great glee. I did some research yesterday and realized that we knew nothing about what happened in that particular year. Yeah. <laughs> so I can just make it up as I go along. It's great. 
That's great. Well, you just mentioned research, and and I know that um, uh, you will soon have your first nonfiction book published, Waterloo. What was it like writing nonfiction history versus your typical historical fiction novels? Well, I mean, it was obviously this is my one and only nonfiction book, Waterloo, um, and it's time really to come out to coincide with the bicentenary, which is July, uh, June the eighteenth this year. Um, I've always wanted to write it because Waterloo is, a, is an amazing story. It's a, it's a cliffhanger of a story, and even if you know the story well, as obviously I do, it's still thrilling because you get to that the evening of, of that dreadful day, and it was an awful day, and and the it, the sun is going down, and you still cannot be quite sure who's going to win this. Um, it's an extraordinary cliffhanging story. Uh, and I'd, I'd always wanted to write it, um, but mainly, I think, to write it from the point of view of what was it actually like to be there. There are lots and lots of books on Waterloo, and lot, they're very, very good, and, and many of them are very technical about the tactics that were used and the equipment that was used and the mistakes that were made. But what was it actually like to be there? And, and that's what I try to do in this book, is to say, look, these poor guys, this is what it was like. Now, of course, the one good thing about writing a book like Waterloo is that I don't have to invent the story. 95% of the work of writing a novel is actually coming up with the plot. Or well, Waterloo history has handed you a ready-made plot. The difficulty was to find enough voices, I mean, French voices and Prussian voices and Dutch voices and obviously British voices, to tell all the story of what it, what it was actually like to be there on that day. But it was my one and only. I'm not doing another one. <laughs> you, you said that pretty definitively. <laughs> oh, one is enough. Yes. 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 Well, well. Um, you just mentioned that you know towards the end of that day that there was still uh, a question in the air of like who who was going to to be the victor. Was was there a? I mean, from your research and your knowledge, I mean, was there a, a certain thing at towards the end of the day that 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 clinched the victory? In your opinion, I think it, the real story of Waterloo is. A- story of French mistakes. Um, the, the, the campaign is very, very quick. It, it, it's four days. And in those four, four days, there are three major battles and one minor battle. Um, the first two days, Napoleon absol- is absolutely on top. I mean, his, his, his strategy works perfectly. Uh, everything he's aiming to do, he really has achieved. And then suddenly they begin to make a whole lot of mistakes. And, and it's very curious. That, and, and I think part of that was just extraordinarily bad luck. Um, part of it, I suspect, was because Napoleon was perhaps not on his top form. I mean, the other unique thing about Waterloo is that nobody in 1815 would have doubted that the two greatest soldiers of the age, I mean, head and shoulders above everybody else, were Napoleon and the Duke of Wellington. I mean, Napoleon, who had conquered Europe, I mean, he'd, made, he'd had some dreadful defeats like Russia, but even his defeats on a gargantuan scale. I mean, the man is extraordinary. His armies have marched from Madrid to Moscow. Uh, he's, he's beaten every enemy in turn, one after the other. Uh, um, he's one of the great battlefield generals. And the other man is the Duke of Wellington, who has fought over 20 major battles and has never lost a battle, unlike Napoleon, who had lost battles. And everybody knows that these two are the greatest soldiers of the age, and they've never met. They've never fought each other. So this is the Wimbledon final. It's the number one and two seed meeting in this final. And I think it's fair to say that Wellington was on pretty good form, and Napoleon, for some reason, seemed rather lackadaisical. Now, some people have said it's because he was ill. He never claimed that. Um, I think a lot of it came from overconfidence. He thought he could probably just do it, and and then discover that he couldn't. But... uh, even so, as, 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 as Wellington said afterwards, he said, I never came so near to being beat. He said it was a desperate business, a, a near close run thing. It was a very, very desperate battle, a horrible battle. Hmm. That's interesting. Well, well, as I mentioned earlier, you're very well known for your popular Sharp novels featuring Richard Sharp. I'm curious, do you have the next Sharp novel planned or have you started writing it? I'm so sorry, I missed that the last part of that question. I was just wondering, uh, have you planned the next Sharp novel, or, or have you started writing it? Uh, the next Sharp novel or the next novel? The next Sharp novel. Oh, no, I, Sharp is, is having a long rest at the moment. Um, <laughs> there were 21 books in the series, and, and uh, I would actually like to do another one. I don't know when I'll do it. I mean, I always said I'll save it for my retirement, but I think I'm in my retirement now. 
But I think one day I'll I'll, I'll indulge myself and, and write another sharp novel. But but um, on the whole, I think he's probably being put to bed. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but I you know I still get a lot of requests to write just one more. I request to write more. So I think probably one day I'll give in and just do the one. Sure, sure. Well, well, Sharp's Eagle, the first Sharp novel, was published in 1981. Had you written any fiction before you sat down and wrote that novel? I didn't know what I was doing in 1981. I, oh, in 1980 when I wrote it, I didn't have a clue. Uh, I mean, I had a perfectly good job. I was a television producer in, in England, and or actually in Ireland. And, I mean, I, you know, I had a, a career going. It was it was. Really, I dare say, even quite a successful career. I was, I was head of current affairs television for the BBC in Northern Ireland. And, and then fatally, I met this American blonde. And she couldn't go to live in Britain because she had family connections, which were, which were incredibly tight. But I really didn't have any ties. So I said very airily, well, I'll go and live in America, which I did in 1980. And then the, the American government, in its great wisdom, refused to give me a green card. So, you know, I was basically an illegal immigrant. So I said, well, what can I do to earn money? And I thought, well, I've always wanted to write a book, so why don't you write a book? So I sat down and I wrote Sharp's Eagle. And, well, it's too late now to tell me, you know, to tell the government that I'm an illegal immigrant because I'm a citizen now. And we've written 55 books, and Judy and I have been married for 35 years, so it worked. But it was a crazy decision when you think about it. It was insane <laughs> you know, to give up a perfectly good job and go and do something I'd never done before. And, and but there it is. I mean, yeah, fifty-five and, books later, I'm still here. Yes. And and do you remember at this point? Do you remember when you sat down? What, what the the idea and the process for coming up with with Sharp Eagle? Yeah, I remember? didn't know that. I didn't know the process. I knew what I wanted to write. I mean, one of the conclusions I've come to over, over these thirty-five years of writing is that is that writing is easy. Writing well is is a lot harder, and the hardest thing of all is knowing what to write about. But I, luckily, I did know what I wanted to write about because when I when I was a, a, a kid, I loved the Hornblow stories by C.S. Forrester, uh, and there were eleven of those, and I read them avidly. And then suddenly, there were no more books coming up, so I went and started to read the non-fiction histories of the period just to get more of the same. And through them, I discovered this, these extraordinary stories about the Peninsula War and Wellington's fight against Napoleon. And so I used to haunt the bookshops looking for a Hornblower series on land. And, of course, nobody wrote it. And, and when I came to America, I thought, well, you've always wanted to read that series. Why don't you write it? So, I, I mean, yes, I knew what I wanted to write about. I knew I was going to do Hornblower on land. But what it was, I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I mean, I just sat down one day and started writing. And, and you learn as you go along. <laughs> That's great. Well, well, as the Sharp series grew, was there ever a time where you wish you had planned or written the series differently, just in terms of logistics? <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, what happened was I wrote, I think I wrote the first 10 books, and I got into Waterloo, and I said, okay, that's it, it is done. Um, and I started another series um, about the American Civil War with a character called Starbuck, which I'd never finished, and I actually loved Nathaniel Starbuck. He's a great character. And just as I'd done, I don't know, about the fourth or fifth book in that series, um, the television in England decided to make a, a series about Sharp. Well, you know, my mother didn't give birth to any fools, and it was pretty obvious that what, what I should be doing was writing Sharp again, because he was going to be all over the television. And so I went back, and I thought, well, I can't carry on from Waterloo, because nothing much happens, which means I'm going to have to go back and write a whole new series <laughs> covering the same years. Well, the trouble with that is because is that is they really don't dovetail together. I mean, you, you had to sort of force the books into the cracks. And I mean, the sad thing is, is that the heroines in the second series all have to die because they don't appear in the first books. And so, yeah, I wish I, I mean, I'm, I, I wish I'd written them chronologically <laughs> instead of writing them out of order. And um, but, but you know, they're, they're, they're still fun. They're, they're, they're this sort of work, I think. Sure, sure. Well, well, as you said earlier, uh, in terms of the writing process, you you said that you're writing a, a, a there's a larger story in the background and and a story obviously in the foreground. This this fictional. Um, what is your writing process like? Do you plan extensively before you sit down and write a novel? Oh, it's chaotic. It's absolutely chaotic. I mean, some people can plan books ahead. I mean, Forrester always claimed that he planned books ahead. Uh, and um, I had a friend of mine, Patrick Robinson, you know. 
knows what's going to happen in every chapter before it begins to write. And, and wonderful Joanna Rowling, evidently, you know, plotted out the whole of Harry Potter before she began. I don't have a clue what's going to happen in these books. And I, mean, I remember I got to the end of The Empty Throne. I was actually writing the last chapter, and I didn't know how it was going to end. And I suppose that, for, I mean, I think it was Somerset Maugham who said there are three rules for writing a novel. Unfortunately, no one knows what they are. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I would love to plan. You know, I mean, whenever you, you listen to people who teach writing, they say you must plan your writing first. But I, I've never done it. I can't do it. I just, I had no idea. And it seems to me that a story is like a journey that's never been taken before. And how can you... How can you draw a map of a journey that you've never taken? The only way you can find out where it goes is to actually take the journey. And part of the excitement of reading a good novel is to find out what happens. And, and that's actually true about writing them, too, for me. For me, the, the, the joy of writing it is to find out what happens. And, and so I, I, mean, I really do wish I could plan it. It would make life a lot easier. But, but what I tend to do is just write away and see what happens and then take it on from there. And eventually a plot does emerge, and then you have to go back and start the book again. <laughs> so, so do you? It's not do you, very efficient. <laughs> do you ever find yourself having to throw chapters away, or or find that you've kind of written yourself into a dead end? Oh yeah, yeah, that happens. Absolutely, it happens all the time. Uh, and I call it putting doors into alleyways. <laughs> and and by what, what I mean by that is that you know you, you get to chapter twelve, and let's we'll talk about sharp book. And Sharp is in an alley. I mean, alley is a blind alley. There's no way out of it. And the walls are 12 feet high, and his rifle is unloaded, and his sword is broken, and he's faced by 20 vengeful Frenchmen who are saying, Aha, Mr. Sharp, we have got you now. And they have. He's dead. And, you know, you, 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 you've reached the end of the Sharp series. But obviously he can't die because he's a hero. <laughs> so what you do is uh, um, you go back to Chapter 3, and you set another scene in that alley, and you establish that, in fact, there's a doorway at the back of the alley. And then, when the Frenchman say, aha, we have got you, Mr. Sharp, Sharp leaks through the door and is free. Now, if you just invented the door in Chapter 12, no one will believe you. They say, ah, that can't be true, you know, it's too convenient. But if, if you, in fact, put the door in Chapter 3, then they do accept that it's there, and they don't actually believe that you invented it. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in other words, you, absolutely. You, <laughs> I mean, I've never actually put a door in an alley in the book, but that's, basic, that's the basic process. And it is terribly inefficient, um, because you suddenly realize in Chapter 10 that you need something very badly. And to establish it, you have to go back and rewrite Chapters 2, 5, 7, and 8. And uh, yeah, it's the only way I know how to do it. So I think it was the old doctor who said that writing a novel is a bit like driving along an unfamiliar country road at night. And you can only see as far ahead as your other dim headlamps will show. And I think that's true. Um, you know, you, you can only see a little way ahead, and, and you can, all you can do is keep driving and hope you get somewhere. You do eventually get there. Sure, sure. Well, well given, given your extensive um, success and, and, and uh, all of the novels that you've written, do you have any advice for aspiring writers in terms of um, writing or the writing process? Oh, I, I, I was told them to explore the exciting world of chartered accountancy. Um, <laughs> no, let me be serious. Yeah, I mean, I do have advice. I, I'm not sure it's particularly good advice, because I suppose, you know, I, I tend to, to tell them to do what I did, and, um, which is, you know, you sit down and you do it. And I, I'm very, very suspicious of writing groups and, I guess, you know, creative writing um, as a subject. I don't, I don't know how you can teach it. I mean, maybe you can teach it. I've obviously never been to a, to a creative writing course. Maybe I'd be a better writer if I had. Uh, but I think everybody has... A, I think in the first place, you write yourself. You write what you want to read. And if you, you dilute that process by throwing it open to a group, um, how do you know that the advice you're getting is good? Because they're telling you what they want to read, not what you want to read. So the first person you write for is yourself. The second person you write for is an agent or a publisher. And if you've succeeded in those two, then you're probably going to get an audience. So I, I really do think the best thing to do is that there is, there is no shortcut. You, you just have to sit down and write. That's, that's good advice. So you mentioned earlier that you're currently working on a sac, another Saxon novel or Saxon tale. 
uh, do you do you have um, do you have plans, or do you know what you're going to write after you finish that? Where I'm going after this, no, not really. Um, I mean, one book at a time is enough. I mean, I I do want to write a series set in the 16th century, and that may come next. And, and I'm sort of reading the 16th century while I'm writing this book. Um, but I just don't know. I mean, it's the the, the other problem is and it's the same problem I had with the chart books is that the filming the Saxon book right now, the uh, the people who made um, Downton Abbey um, are making a series about the books, about Uhtred, my hero. And uh, the, all of them are over in Hungary right now filming. And that means that probably, you know, the, this time next year, Uhtred will be all over British television because the BBC are doing it, and it will be shown in America, though I don't know when. And then, you know, if it's even halfway successful, there'll be a second series. And then my publishers, who are not idiots, are going to say to me, oh, we want more Saxon books. <laughs> so I'm probably stuck with the Saxons for a couple of years. But, I mean, that's a purely venal decision to coincide with television. <laughs> so, so 16th century, um, any, uh, any particular setting? Would that be in Britain as well? Oh, yeah, it'll be in Britain. I mean, I, I grew up there, and I hear British voices. And, and I'm fairly comfortable writing book set in, in the United States, but, but um, again, because I've lived here a lot enough to, to, to have a feel for it, but uh, I can't imagine writing anything outside of the States or, or Britain. Sure. Well, well, great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Bernard Cornwell, best-selling historical novelist. As we've been discussing, Cornwell's latest novel, The Empty Throne, is in bookstores now, so gra go grab a copy. And Bernard, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you very much. Thanks. You know when you order a new video game, or a golf club, or a blender, and then it arrives at your door, you get a little thrill. Imagine how much more thrilling it is when you order a new car. With Nissan at Home, you can shop for the perfect ride and order it without ever having to go anywhere. Sure beats a golf club or a blender. Buy a new car entirely online with Nissan at Home. Deliver direct from dealer to driveway. Thrill starts here. Services may vary at participating dealers subject to applicable lossy dealer for details.